Uh, good afternoon, everyone who has joined us. Today we'll be uh, conducting an expert analytical club on the topic what international organizations can do for Belarus. Uh, I would like to remind you that we're recording the discussion. The recording will be available on the Press Club's YouTube channel. And those who will watch our discussion on YouTube, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so as not to miss our videos. I would like to give floor now to co-moderator of the discussion, Mr. Vadim Majeka. Vadim, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Anton. Thank you for the introductory remarks. Good afternoon to everyone once again. We started planning today's discussion long before the plane incident happened, but all this have made our discussion even more relevant. Because indeed, the role of international organizations is becoming more and more important. On the one hand, we see that the Belarusian crisis, considering the plane diversion, has uh, reached the international level. And the approaches that Belarusians felt before are now felt uh, by various passengers. And this raised the Belarusian problem in the eyes of the European politician. On the other hand, on the background of the repression growth in Belarus, we see that uh, the support for uh, feedback and uh, some response from the international organization is growing. In the recent weeks, I also noted that there's a growing tension. Okay, we, we've lost Vadim. I think we lost you for about 10 seconds. Right, so uh, I was saying that uh, people are a bit uh, uh, not happy with the words like growing concern. And uh, Belarus wants to see the concrete steps. I think this is a dilemma about what to do next, what the real possibilities and uh, possible steps of the international guests could be. On the other hand, there are other unused mechanisms that could be used in order to help solve the Belarusian crisis, solve issues, punish those who violated human rights, and so on and so forth. We are going to discuss all this today. Uh, first, I would like to give floor to Oleg Gluck. I can see uh, Oleg now and ask Oleg to introduce us into the Belarusian context and uh, mention some international mechanisms. We start with the global one, with the United Nations. We'll discuss what the UN can and uh, has to do to punish those who are responsible for the crimes and what mechanisms have already been used and can be used. Oleg, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm uh, sorry for joining this conversation from the car, but I didn't have enough time to get home or the office because I was just on the way back from the meeting where we discussed the building reality. The reality that uh, where, where we need the assistance from the United Nations, among other organizations. UN is not, is actually the only specialized mechanism that involves the human rights available for Belarusians. Since we're not members of the Council of Europe, this uh, system has not, we haven't joined it. so instruments of influence and, and protection for Belarusians. These things are not available for Belarusians. 
why I'm saying the United Nations is the major one, because the OC is a much more soft mechanism. Of the UN mechanism, we have quite a few already involved, I would say more than usual, because we are actually working with a whole range of the mechanisms, at least of, uh, of those that we know of, and um, we have even used more of them. I mean, there are special rapporteurs, special rapporteurs and uh, country rapporteurs, like a nice marine. They are uh, they're involved in this process and we constantly communicate with them on the Belarusian issue. Belarus, not so long ago, received uh, the global recommendations in the framework of uh, the long-term process and uh, long-term mechanism individual addresses regarding the human rights violations that are available for Belarusians to some degree. This all is available. Also have a new mechanism of, uh, in the framework of the Commissar that uh, is involved in the investigation of the uh, torture in Belarus. We don't know how it will end and uh, what we can expect from them. But overall, if we evaluate the system in terms of its functions and what we can expect from it, I would say that uh, first and foremost, the first major task is to call a spade a spade, as we say, when in the framework of... Uh, this is uh, the competent body that we have recognized and uh, which is recognized by the international community. So it uh, should be used to give a relevant assessment to what is happening in with human rights in Belarus. The f major task of all these mechanisms is to give an assessment to these activities and to call them the proper name. Without this, to my mind, the everything else remains on the sidelines, including the United Nations mechanism that are based on this evaluation. Of course, I. Uh, the assessment, uh, the definitions that are given to the local human rights defenders are important, but it's much better when we have all these conclusions made by the uh, structures, which, as I said, operate within international mandates, which uh, in turn have been recognized by the government of Belarus. When the we have called everything their names. Next point is how to protect the victims, how to launch the compensation mechanism. And here we face the challenge of the authority. Our country shows that we understand the standards and, and we do not share the assessments. So, uh, in other words, we don't really recognize these assessments and we don't want to do what these bodies recommend to us. This is a major problem that I believe needs to be taken care of by the United Nations bodies. They need to develop their system to, for it to become more effective, not just to have a certain name. Another important point is that further relations 
in terms of business cooperation, political cooperation, bilateral, multilateral relations. These assessments, recommendations, these conclusions and messages that are given by the UN structures further create a measurement system, which I must know has not proven very effective as of yet. Or it is actually mostly uh, used for the situations when the local government is not is ready to cooperate and to work with the UN. But that's what we have for now. Thank you, Alec. Thank you for this overview. Next, I would like to give floor to Konstantin Dikterov, who is one of the speakers today. Before this event, we published your article about the diversion of the plane. As a professor of uh, national law, could you comment on the UN mechanisms and how in situations like Belarus we should expect things to unravel? Because uh, apart from calling things their names, we need to, we want to uh, have some uh, documented response by the United Nations. Thank you very much, Vadim. Thank you, Anais and Oleg. My colleague, colleagues have uh, actually explained the situation with regarding the United Nations role. In fact, there are quite a few mechanisms. We can actually hear Konstantin. Those of you who cannot hear Konstantin should switch in the language channel. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Right, so um, stay on this channel. I would like to repeat it for Oleg. Before you joined us, I uh, thank the previous speakers, including you, for detailing for us the situation. On the whole, uh, the United Nations is a serious organization. UN can do a lot. The United Nations organization has a lot of legal mechanisms. The UN Charter allows to do a lot including the, the uh, launch of the ad hoc tribunals, criminal tribunals. This is well and good, but majority of these mechanisms have a problem to implement them. They need consent. If we read the UN Charter, it all boils down to to UN Security Council permanent members, because the Security Council is the major body, who, which can resort to even military scenarios. I'm uh, talking here on the whole, not about Belarus in particular, but for a certain scenario to work, uh, the agreement of all members, in particular those of permanent members, is required because the permanent members may veto almost any decision by the United Nations. As we know, among the permanent members of the United Nations, there are like regular states they usually support the regime in the list, like China and Russia. Hence, the effectiveness of this body is very often questioned. Therefore, 
we can come up with a lot of mechanisms. The question is if it's possible to launch these mechanisms. Therefore, the political aspect here is very important. However, I would like to reiterate what Oleg said, particularly that only extreme mechanism may force the state to do something. Usually the international cooperation is based on cooperation of the states and the states that are affected by this must at least agree with these foundations. As we see in the case of Belarus, it actually ignores the majority of uh, actions that are conducted towards it and by the United Nations. Among them, the, the decisions and resolutions of the various UN committees that are not fulfilled. So their attitude to the UN as something non-binding is actually seen as a red line and a major line of activity among the Russian authorities. Many noticed this, noticed this approach on Sunday, but this approach has been witnessed for a long while. I have uh, mentioned a couple of times that this incident that happened on Sunday is not a long-standing episode. It's one of the number of things that we have seen happening. So launching a mechanism is not enough. The uh, Human Rights Council has a certain expert panel mentioned by Oleg that will document the situation with human rights and violations of human rights in Belarus. That's fine, but the question is, what consequence will have? The OC has launched the Moscow mechanism and it has uh, concrete proposals in a special report published by the OEC expert. What did it lead to? I uh, don't believe, believe it led to anything concrete inside Belarus. My last point is regarding to the countries in the United Nations that don't show the best attitude to human rights. My major specialty is that uh, human rights court. I uh, don't watch the meetings of the Human Rights Council very often, but when the Belarusian issue was discussed, I did watch it, and I, uh, I can't say I've seen a more depressive meeting when some countries express their position at the meetings that has nothing to do with human rights. Uh, therefore, in a nutshell, what I mean is that the United Nations has uh, organization has a lot of mechanisms to affect the situation, but the political will and uh, uh, agreement of the members needs to be there, particularly those uh, that of the permanent members. Secondly, the international law for it to have some influence. There needs to be some feedback from uh, the side of the state, but Belarus in this case, only when these two conditions are met, the, effect, the national law can be effective. But this is more of a political issue than a legal issue. The law presents the opportunities to implement this, but boils down to international politics and uh, international relations. Thank you. Thank you, Konstantin. Uh, thank you, Kassin, for making it clear.
for for us, many uh, commentators would be happy to understand this. It's very sad to understand that the, in our case, it boils down to decision by Russia. Right, let's give floor to Svetlana Valko. As a coordinator of uh, various programs, hopefully she will tell us more about the potential mechanism that UN possesses for Belarus. Some uh, have been already used, some hopefully will be used, and what potential there is. Thank you, Vadim. Good afternoon, friends. Frankly speaking, I'm a bit uh, uh, scared by you company, particularly that of Constantin, because I'm not a national lawyer, and my major specialty is uh, working uh, in the field and collection of evidence, collecting the evidence, and the verification and preparation of evidence for international lawyers in Belarus. We launched this work back in August. Over the last 12 months of the last year, we have prepared a wide collection of the human rights violations. I would even call some of them the crime against humanity, conducted by the Belarusian authorities. The big question is what to do with it and where to take it the National Partnership for Human Rights has a long history of working in line with standards and uh, cooperating with the International Criminal Court. Personally, for the last seven years, I've been actually working with the Criminal Court, National Criminal Court, regarding my work in Ukraine and Georgia. When we started working on Belarus, at first, we were trying to support our Belarusian partners so that they would continue their work and support particularly those who left the country, support those we tried to support them. At the same time, we were collecting evidence, verifying them. We made them an interactive accountability map where all the videos and photos collected and were verified according to the international standards for the use of this evidence by whom it may concern. We are also planning to use them in our cases on universal jurisdiction. Any person can use uh, some of this evidence for their cases. But let's go back to International Criminal Court. For a number of reasons, understandable to everyone, Belarus is not part of, but we were not able to turn to this court with our communication because Belarus is not a member of this organization and without the relevant resolution of the Security Council, the International Court cannot uh, get involved and prosecute any criminals and the torture of Belarus. But we have remembered the uh, exclusion that was, was made for um, Burma from Myanmar, and we have we started to collect evidence in order to make a submission to the International Criminal Court using Article 15, and also using the fact that a big part about 14,000 uh, Belarusians had to leave the country, to flee the country, afraid. Uh, to be tortured, killed, and arrested. Majority of them are in the, now in the countries 
like Lithuania, Poland, and even Ukraine. These countries are member countries and uh, subject to the work of the International Court. In Lithuania, we started collecting evidence of Belarusians who went out to this country. That was our first step. After we collected some evidence, it was uh, quite difficult to do because there were some coronavirus restrictions and a big paranoia behind, particularly of uh, some respondents who were suffered who suffered a lot from the persecution. Uh, was had some not only physical but also psychological traumas who were arrested multiple times, who were given sentences. So this work wasn't the easiest one. We tried to prove that the authorities forced people to flee. How was it done? Some people were physically forced into the neutral zone. Others were ordered to leave, were told either you leave or you will be charged. Some people were arrested multiple times until, until they understood that the next arrest is imminent. Some people were on the receiving end of violence that, that tried to avoid. In November, Lukashenko said that the nucleus, about 2,000 protesters, had to be taken to Lithuania and Poland. He also ratified the, the law that allows the authorities of the, the regime to uh, take away the, the citizenship from some people. Also, he said that uh, we're not uh, preventing anyone from leaving, but if you leave, you will not come back. Thus, we saw that the message is clear. You either stay with us and do what we say, or leave and never come back. Even though the legal restrictions does not allow for our submission, the case was submitted to reflect the whole range of violations in Belarus, like torture, illegal arrests, murder, kidnappings, and so on. But this is the only available for now way of drawing this regime to responsibility in the framework of International Criminal Court. We made a submission and asked the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to launch an investigation regarding deportation and persecution. Svetlana, we'll um, discuss some of these uh, things later, but can you tell us more about the UN mechanisms? Are they available? Can be used? Well, I uh, cannot add too much on this because we really resort to that. Many of our colleagues specialized on this. So I just want to add that this morning, we uh, conducted the supplementary communications with the court regarding the situation. And this then uh, took place on Saturday. It was done using Article 12 of the Roman Statute. Part 2 uh, saying that uh, the state where this that took place since the airplane is registered in Poland, 
we uh, are allowed to make this additional communication regarding this incident. Thank you, Svetlana. We'll definitely go back to the international criminal prosecution mechanism because we see that the international ICC is new. Let's move to the next question. Next point, second round of discussion. Um, we'll not concentrate on the new nations organizations anymore, but on some other organizations, maybe some European based one, like Council of Europe and that the OSC. What are the limitations and the capabilities? Apart from expressing deep concern, of course. What can countries do? What they cannot do? Let's follow the same order, start with Oleg. We remember that Belarus is not a member of the Council of Europe. And clearly, many, many uh, options that are available of the ESCHR that are available to us, not available to Belarusians. I'd like to add a point and very small remarks. Apart from the long term jurisdictions, I mean, the, the courts, UN has other mechanisms that could be used in humanitarian issues. I mean, uh, working through uh, UNDP and uh, other bodies, uh, assistance could be provided to the refugees who are now in the countries outside Belarus, like Lithuania, Ukraine. And here, some assistance can be provided, technical assistance to those who require it. Into the European mechanism is a great tool, but again, once again, we are going back to what we need to remember. The elements, the points, the key points that mentioned by me and my colleagues. First and foremost, the European mechanisms, just like the UN mechanisms, are all aimed at cooperation and uh, at helping countries becoming better, having a better human rights record and during this cooperation. They uh, set to improve the situation. Secondly, the countries are acting based on the free will. In our human rights, circles, we often discuss the binding, non-binding nature of uh, UN and European mechanisms. Basically, boils down to, since the European mechanism uh, more focused, and clearly formulated, particularly if uh, we can set the ICJ decision and on the Human Rights Council decision. But two major points here, the goodwill and sovereignty the play a major role. This is the foundation of international law, at least for now. Also, uh, we are not a member of the Council of Europe. Uh, we are a member of the OC, but it's a consensus organization. But going back to the UN system, uh, there are mechanisms that uh, involves the ex expert work. And experts can 
call the things their names i qualify it better from the legal standpoint and uh, in many ways uh, more legal mechanisms but there's a political level where it's a country level particularly UN, UN and uh, ICJ. And uh, ECHR. But uh, in Europe, it's, uh, it's a club that has fewer members, a club that involves the state that more like gentlemen. There, that in respect to human rights is actually checked at the very entrance. So the question uh, whether somebody needs to force to do something, these things are out of the question. But the, th the things like threats are also out of the question. We're not afraid of any threats, at least Belgian authorities. The, the Council of Europe for us still is interesting and important for us because a certain level of cooperation has been achieved. We are participants to some conventions there. Probably most important thing here is that uh, our constitutional court is a member of the Venice Commission meetings uh, it allows us to get some competent opinion from this highly regarded body like the venice commission they always see it is a organization that unites The representatives of the region, the major mechanism, the uh, country mechanisms. Here we see the it's strong and weak side. The strong side is that if they reach consensus, consensus, everything works. But the problem here is that it's difficult to reach this consensus. And uh, if somebody needs to condemn, criticize someone country that uh, does not want to comply, the, the questions arise. There's no China in the OECE, but uh, there's Russia, which can actually uh, level down or balance some negative attitudes. Also, the Moscow mechanism could be launched for this. The desire of several states needs to coincide. It has been launched, Konstantin has already mentioned it. This is a very important mechanism from the point of view of calling things their names. A lot has been made, and this was a serious report. There, there is some uh, important recommendations and uh, conclusions to be made. It's a situation where the mechanism shows their weaknesses. We can come up with some more things in the framework of these mechanisms. Some technical approaches are probably available, but we cannot avoid uh, the key problem here. Maybe not a problem, but key uh, side or 
specificity of this. It's like the cooperation and sovereignty. These things are unchangeable, unassailable, and impossible to avoid them. So that sometimes it's impossible to turn them on. But going back to calling things their names, but when the legal qualification is made to what is happening, bilateral, multilateral relations, Particularly when we look at what happened through the prism of plane diversion and some restrictions, in the future it will affect the economy and things that cannot be put under the carpet, swept under the carpet. Thank you, Oleg. Indeed, the example with the plane is a very important. Let's go back to Konstantin. And maybe uh, you can tell us more about the European mechanism and the potential ways of affecting the situation involving other initiatives in, in the world, maybe they, that have to do with the African countries, Middle East, Asian countries. Because we have always said that we are a European country, but since uh, the recent uh, experiences, maybe we should uh, put ourselves in the same group with this African countries like Somali, Somali pirates. And so. actually, I specialized on the Council of Europe, main court of human rights. So um, I'll be brief. Oleg Elsley actually told us a lot about the OSC, but I would like to remind you that uh, there are countries like Turkmenistan and other Middle East uh, countries in the OSC that will probably not support the Belarusian civil society here. Belarus is not part of the Council of Europe, it uh, has not ratified the relevant convention. It means that you cannot sue Belarus there. It looks like it all ends here, but from the point of view, plain diversion. But as I wrote in my article, in case of European Court of Human Rights, uh, since the airplane is registered in Poland, there could be some connection there. But uh, Belarus cannot be involved in the case of the Um, complaints, only they can be brought against Poland. But this can be done if Poland actually does not fulfill something in this respect, but we cannot complain about Poland regarding to what Belarus committed. We have precedents when the Moldova um, actually had to, was to be held responsible to what happened in Transnistria. Maldo did not control the situation there, but you see the difference in cases we see. We here can talk about the differences in terms of jurisdiction and description of jurisdiction. In terms of other creative approaches, there are ongoing consultations in the international uh, air border. Uh, 
international civil air post association also venetian venice commission is a very important body here but we need to understand that venice commission is not court is a expert organization expert body that can give the conclusion regarding some constitutional changes uh, legal changes it can recommend the best ways to improve the impartiality of the court so it's not a, a court but a legal body it's just the european courts of human rights holds its jurisdiction here which which has a, a is not relevant for belarus because belarus has ratified the convention i cannot be more optimistic here but even if, if we not mention the European Court of Human Rights, the Council of Europe from the very beginning was very slow in its reaction to what happened in Belarus. There are some extraordinary mechanisms and the rapporteur and on Belarus. There was a rapporteur on Belarus in the Council of Europe. There were also ideas about creating special mechanisms of uh, torture investigation. But as far as I know, this hasn't led to any particular results. It's a very important point regarding the parliamentary assembly. but we work with what we have. The parliamentary assembly mechanism is an instrument. I mean, the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe isn't a tool of another approach to involve or to attract the attention of the European politicians. This is an extra measure. But indeed, it cannot be called uh, an effective instrument of pressure in this case. Right, we're not uh, expecting the blue helmets or Council of Europe here. But let's go on and give floor to Svetlana Baliko. We'll discuss other courts later. Do you know any mechanisms apart from those that can be used maybe Ukraine or Georgia? There can be of use in, in Belarus, maybe some international organizations that we haven't discussed yet. We haven't discussed the universal jurisdiction cases. Actually, many international organizations, I mean, uh, NGOs, including ours, they hold negotiations with the prosecutors of various countries about involving or uh, joint responsibility. The majority of the prosecutors that we discussed the Ukrainian issue, and uh, in case of Georgia, basically the case that you bring needs to be bulletproof. The majority, they uh, prefer to review the torture cases. Unlike them, permanent courts. The same is true about the United Kingdom. We now uh, have a case which will be reviewed in the framework of the. But 
But I believe it's important to remember the political mechanism, like sanctions. In many approaches, there are individual responsibility. I personally believe that that personal responsi responsibility. We're not saying it's shaming or blaming, but individual approach to responsibility. Uh, not the the major leader, the Führer, but if we say that the executors and the prosecutors, they share this responsibility. In this case, this thing is very important. I think this could bring down the, the chance of the repeated violence, irrespective of the, whether there is a military conflict or not. There's personal responsibility. And the work on uh, collecting evidence against concrete people that only give orders, but also follow them. It is possible not at the legal level, but at the level of repetition of this violence act. It helps to bring down the instant number of instances of violence. So this also must be one of our goals. It's nice and well when we argue about uh, ban on flights regarding Belarus. and the ban on the Bilave, but we shouldn't forget the fact that people are being tortured. Apart from the fact that the Belarus will be held responsible for this terrorist act, we need also to protect this person who has been tortured. We work a lot with regarding sanctions in Ukraine and uh, sanctions against people at the occupied territories. Sometimes they are the only mechanism we can use because the criminal prosecution for people who commit acts of violence and violate human rights and who practice torture is sometimes not there. But uh, from what I remember, these actions do give results in terms of helping bring down the violence levels at least, uh, for a while. I'm thinking that maybe in Belarus, we're living too much in the current moment. Maybe we should talk more about uh, people who committed crimes in the Balkans and uh, Nazi criminals were held responsible decades after the crimes were committed. In any case, we should uh, think more of that. As I understand, your organization is involved in this. Do you have any information regarding the mechanisms of international persecution and prosecution? Let's imagine the Belarusian citizen who suffered um, torture and uh, injustice. For example, let's say they managed to leave for Germany. 
they have uh, their case documented. How big a chance there is that they will turn to the German court and have a decision of the court, put the Belarusian prosecutor or judge in the Interpol lists, on Interpol lists. How realistic is that? Or is it too far-fetched? I think it's possible. Is something that springs to mind. I will see that uh, this mechanism works. If um, I remember right, uh, there was a case involving the Netherlands and Ethiopia. When a lot, there were a lot of victims living not only in the Netherlands but other countries as well. And they testified the perpetrator was also residing in the Netherlands. So it was a case when they did prosecute the person and to draw this person to responsibility, even though the person was pretending that uh, they, it was a simple citizenship not a torturer. The thing is that in line with international court of human rights, we can uh, only involve the deportation. We worked with people in Lithuania, but there's also Ukraine, Poland, Czech Republic. Where Lots of victims of regime are residing now. In terms of Ukraine, we understand very well that if uh, the country is not a party to international court of justice, this set of tools and instruments used by the court is limited. Let's say the, uh, there's an order for arrest of Qaddafi is issued. It means that all the member states needs to follow this order. Let's say we the court passes a decision, but we cannot follow it because this, the, the person is hiding in Russia or is simply not living in Belarus. They have everything. They have a tractor, they have a house, and uh, this isolation that this person finds themselves in is uh, important is valuable because the person cannot go to 152 countries where the authorities must arrest or detain them also this person is not only in isolation their assets are restricted and isolated we shouldn't forget that we shouldn't forget about the financial opportunities financial sources of the regime and that we need to get, stop it so that it will not be enough to support the repressive machine, which is actually huge. The right police needs to get paid. And uh, well paid. I think the BIPOL initiative that was created in Poland is an unprecedented tool. It involves a policeman that did not want to participate in the violent act. Involving Belarusians that support them, use their attacks, 
I think the cases that are prepared by BIPOL together with uh, the Polish Helsinki Committee, Lithuanian uh, government, among others, they will have a detailed evidence base since this organization involves former policemen. I believe these initiatives are very important. If we want to draw people to personal responsibility, if we want to use um, multiple mechanisms, including the International Crim Court of Justice, Somebody is asking here about 14,000 of refugees. That was a total amount of people on the day of, we submit information to the International Court of Justice, but this is the number of people who left for other countries from Belarus. There are a few of them in Lithuania. Thank you, Svetlana. I will clarify to what Svetlana said about the person who remains in Belarus. The question is how far reaching are these practices? A, a week ago, we had represented by Paul at this session. They collected evidence about um, beatings, about torture performed by the right police. This information reached the German court, which issued an order, let's say, for the arrest. And if right policemen go to Turkey for a holiday, is there a chance that they will be detained on the border? Or is it the mechanism that it applied in exclusive? cases. It is actually a realistic scenario. So let's uh, say hi to right policemen and members of the families. Big mechanism like the ICJ will not only review the cases of involving regular people. So it's the top officials who we cannot draw responsibility. While the the executors needs to be tried at the local level. Let's say the top manager of the Akrestina prison will not get on the list of the top officials, but there are many more cases of evidence, lots of evidence of him giving orders to torture people and treating humanely inmates violates human rights in any possible way. So I believe that the universal jurisdiction cases can involve people who were fallen orders, committing acts of torture, or management, managing a team of torturers. But if we uh, take the ICJ, they will only review the cases of the let's say, top managers, top officials that gave general orders. Well, basically, we are near uh, the end of our session that the acting head of state is immune to such cases. But I just remembered that the, after the elections, we spoke about not, not only non-democratic nature of activities and violations, but also about the fact that many countries don't recognize Lukashenko as a legal president. 
So the question is, uh, is Lukashenko immune to such cases if some countries don't recognize him as the acting president? Have there been any presidents in the history, in the legal history? Is there in a window of possibility here? Maybe Oleg or Svetlana could comment on this. I'm not an expert on this. To give you an expert commentary, but as I see, it's not so much important uh, how legally the person was elected and whether we recognize. One thing is to recognize some agreements that were signed by this person on value transfer and so on, but you know, to draw this person's responsibility. The factors protecting this person could be overwhelm overwhelming, but that's not an expert opinion. I wanted to mention some other things, but maybe later. Does anybody else want to comment on this? If not, Oleg will continue. I just wanted to say that I believe that uh, it's important to understand today that this mechanism protecting people against the human rights violations and um, ways to draw people to responsibility what we see in Belarus now, should not be regarded only as mechanisms, only as human rights mechanisms. It was exactly why I mentioned the, the necessity to call things their names. Human rights today are an important element of all relations, the business relations, political relations, contacts and cooperations. Not a single country, including Belarus, since uh, particularly Belarus is a relatively small country with an open type economy and a transit kind country, um, instruments of influence do not boil to possibilities in the hands of the national organizations. We see that the country that is, has nothing to against being an outcast in terms of human rights is affected by other mechanisms. And it's not the sanctions as such as political measures. We see that the airplanes stop flying, the country is losing money due to the lack of transit operations. I believe it's about 80, 70, 70 million dollars a year, the losses. We also see here that it's a very serious barrier for investors. We see some chains being broken in the business chains. Authorities say that these are tools of influence, but it's actually quite natural. Businesses do not need such problems. There are lots of other states where such risks do not exist. We need to consider this influence instruments together. So the human rights uh, is an element of the system. 
if we remember how actively the the businesses are, and how highly they hold the reputation, we will understand that there's no avoid in this. If you don't want to live like everyone else and follow their rules, you need to be ready to other people treating you in the same way. Everyone uh, and suffers in this case, but that's what we have. Thank you, Oleg. I think this is a great way to finish our discussion today. Time is out. Time is up, and we need to conclude our meetings. I believe we have discussed a lot of interesting things today.